Section 5 of the History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 5, Chapter 4, Rome, Part 1. Laws Governing Prostitution. Our earliest acquaintance with the Roman laws governing prostitution dates from the reign of the Emperor Augustus, but there is abundant evidence to show that prostitutes were common in the city of Rome at the time when authentic history begins. It does not appear that religious prostitution was ever domiciled in Italy, though in later times the festivals in honor of certain deities were scandalously loose, and, to judge from the Etruscan paintings, the morals of the indigenous Italians must have been disgustingly depraved. In the comedies of Plautus, which are among the oldest works of Roman literature which have reached us, the prostitute, Meretrix, and the bawd, Leno, figure conspicuously. They were, thus, evidently, in the third century before Christ, well-known characters in Roman society. When the Floralian games were instituted, we have no means of knowing. No credit whatever must be placed in the puerile stories of Lactantius about the courtesans Acca Laurentia and Flora, but it is certain that the chief attraction of these infamous celebrations was the appearance of prostitutes on the stage in a state of nudity and their lascivious dances in the presence of the people, and there is evidence in the story that the performance was suspended during the presence of the stern moralist Cato, that they had been long practiced before his time. Indeed, it would not be presuming too far to decide, without other evidence, that prostitution must have become a fixed fact at Rome very shortly after the Romans began to mix freely with the Greek colonists at Tarentum and the other Greek cities in Italy, that is to say, about the beginning of the third century before Christ. We learn from Tacitus that from time immemorial prostitutes had been required to register themselves in the office of the Aedile, the ceremony appears to have been very similar to that now imposed by law on French prostitutes. The woman designing to become a prostitute presented herself before the aedile, gave her age, place of birth, and real name, with the one she assumed if she adopted a pseudonym. The public officer, if she was young or apparently respectable, did his best to combat her resolution. Failing in this, he issued to her a license, licentia stupri, ascertained the sum which she was to demand from her customers, and entered her name in his role. It might be inferred from a law of Justinian that a prostitute was bound to take an oath, on obtaining her license, to discharge the duties of her calling to the end of her life, for the law in question very properly decided that an oath so obviously at war with good morals was not binding. However this was, the prostitute once inscribed incurred the taint of infamy which nothing could wipe off. Repentance was impossible, even when she married and became the mother of legitimate children. The fatal inscription was still there to bear witness of her infamy. In Rome, as in so many other countries, the principle of the law was to close the door to reform, and to render vice hopeless. There is every reason to suppose that these regulations were in force at a very early period of the Republic, of the further rules established under the imperial regime, we shall speak presently. Meanwhile, it may be observed that there is ground for hoping that, at the best age of the Republic, the public morals were not generally corrupt. The old stories of Lucretia and Virginia would have had no point among a demoralized people. All who are familiar with Roman history will remember the fierce contest waged by Cato the censor against the jewels, fine dresses and carriages of the Roman ladies, an indication that graver delinquencies did not call for official interference. This same Cato, after the death of his first wife, cohabited with a female slave. But, though concubinage was recognized by the Roman law, and would seem to have involved no disgrace at a later period, the intrigue no sooner became known than the old censor married a second wife to avoid scandal. A similar inference may be drawn from the strange story told by Livy of the Bacchanalian mysteries introduced into Rome by foreigners about the beginning of the second century before Christ. 
it is not easy at this late day to discover what is true and what false in the statement he gives but there is no reasonable doubt that young persons of both sexes under the impulse of sensuality had established societies for the purpose among others of satisfying depraved instincts to what extent the mania had extended it is not possible to judge the numbers given by the latin writers are not very trustworthy but we may learn how strong was the moral sentiment of the roman people from the very stringent decree which the senate issued on motion of the consul postumius and from the indiscriminate executions of parties implicated in the mysterious rites other evidences of the purity of roman morals might be found if they were wanting in the remarkable fidelity with which the vestals observed their oaths in the tone of the speeches of the statesmen of the time in the high character sustained by such matrons as the mother of the gracchi and finally in the legislation of augustus which professed rather to affirm and improve the old laws than to introduce new principles as we approach the christian era the picture gradually darkens civil wars are usually fatal to private virtue it is not to be doubted that the age of Sylla and Claudius was by no means a moral one. Sylla, the dictator, openly led a life of scandalous debauchery. Claudius, the all-powerful tribune, is accused by Cicero of having seduced his three sisters. Soldiers who had made a campaign in profligate Greece or voluptuous Asia naturally brought home with them a taste for the pleasures they had learned to enjoy abroad. Scipio's baths were dark, through narrow apertures just light enough was admitted to spare the modesty of the bathers but into the baths which were erected in the later years of the republic the light shone as into a chamber even scylla debauched as he was did not think it safe to abdicate power without legislative effort to purify the morals he had so largely contributed to corrupt by his example of the augustan age and the two or three centuries which followed we are enabled to form a close and comprehensive idea our information ceases to be meagre on some points indeed it is only too abundant the object of the julian laws was to preserve the roman blood from corruption and still farther to degrade prostitutes these aims were partially attained by prohibiting the intermarriage of citizens with the relatives or descendants of prostitutes by exposing adulterers to severe penalties and declaring the tolerant husband an accomplice by laying penalties on bachelors and married men without children by prohibiting the daughters of equestrians from becoming prostitutes tiberius from his infamous retreat at capri sanctioned the decree of the senate which enhanced the severity of the laws against adultery by this decree it was made a penal offence for a matron of any class to play the harlot and her lover the owner of the house where they met and all persons who connived at the adultery were declared equally culpable it seems to have been not uncommon for certain married women to inscribe themselves on the ediles list as prostitutes and to occupy a room at the houses of ill fame this was pronounced a penal offence and every encouragement was held out both to husbands and to common informers to prosecute in other respects the republican legislation is believed to have been unaltered by the emperors the formality of inscription its accompanying infamy the consequences of the act remain the same prostitutes carried on their trade under the edile's eye he patrolled the streets and entered the houses of ill fame at all hours of the day and night he saw that they were closed between daybreak and three in the afternoon. In case of brawls, he arrested and punished the disturbers of the peace. He punished by fine and scourging the omission of a brothel keeper to inscribe every female in his house. He insisted on prostitutes wearing the garments prescribed by law and dyeing their hair blue or yellow. On the other hand, he could not break into a house without being habited in the insignia of his office and being accompanied by his lictors. When the edile Hostilius attempted to break open the door of the prostitute Mamilia on his return from a gay dinner, the latter drove him off with stones, and was sustained by the courts. 
the edile was bound also on complaint laid by a prostitute to sentence any customer of hers to pay the sum due to her according to law classes of prostitutes it was the duty of the edile to arrest punish and drive out of the city all loose prostitutes who were not inscribed on his book this regulation was practically a dead letter at no time in the history of the empire did there cease to be a large and well-known class of prostitutes who were not recorded they were distinguished from the registered prostitutes meretriques by the name of prostibuli they paid no tax to the state while their registered rivals contributed largely to the municipal treasury and if they ran greater risks and incurred more nominal infamy than the latter they more frequently contrived to rise from their unhappy condition we have no means of judging of the number of prostitutes exercising their calling at rome capua and the other italian cities during the first years of the christian era during trajan's reign the police were enabled to count thirty two thousand in rome alone but this number obviously fell short of the truth one is appalled at the great variety of classes into which the prostibuli or unregistered prostitutes were divided such were the delicatae corresponding to the kept women or french loretto whose charms enabled them to exact large sums from their visitors the famosae who belonged to respectable families and took to evil courses through lust or avarice the doris who were remarkable for their beauty of form and disdained the use of clothing the lupi or she-wolves who haunted the groves and commons and were distinguished by a particular cry in imitation of a wolf the aelicarii or baker's girls who sold small cakes for sacrifice to venus and priapus in the form of the male and female organs of generation the bustuarii whose home was the burial ground and who occasionally officiated as mourners at funerals the copi servant girls at inns and taverns who were invariably prostitutes the noctiluai or night walkers the blitidae a very low class of women who derived the name from blitum a cheap and unwholesome beverage drunk in the lowest holes the diobolares wretched outcasts whose price was too oboli say two cents the forarii country girls who lurked about country roads the gallinae who were thieves as well as prostitutes the quadrantarii seemingly the lowest class of all whose fee was less than any copper coin now current in contradistinction to these the meretriques assumed an air of respectability and were often called bonae meretriques another and a distinct class of prostitutes were the female dancers who were eagerly sought after and more numerous than at athens they were ionians lesbians syrians egyptians nubians negresses indians but the most famous were spaniards their dances were of the same character as those of the greek flute players the erotic poets of rome have not shrunk from celebrating the astonishing depravity of their performances horace faintly deplored the progress which the ionic dances ionice motus were making even among the roman virgins these prostitutes carried on their calling in defiance of law if detected they were liable to be whipped and driven out of the city but as their customers belonged to the wealthier classes they rarely suffered the penalty of their conduct apart again from all these was the large class of persons who traded in prostitutes the proper name for these wretches was leno bod which was of both sexes though usually represented on the stage as a beardless man with shaven head under this name quite a number of varieties were included such as the lupanarii or keepers of regular houses of ill fame the adductores and perductores pimps conciliatrices and ancillulae women who negotiated immoral transactions and others then as almost every baker tavern keeper bath house keeper barber and perfumer combined the lenocinium or trade in prostitutes with his other calling their various names tonsor unguentarius balnearius etc became synonymous with leno 
this miserable class was regarded with the greatest loathing at rome this hasty classification of the roman prostitutes would be incomplete without some notice however brief of male prostitutes fortunately the progress of good morals has divested this repulsive theme of its importance the object of this work can be obtained without entering into details on a branch of the subject which in this country is not likely to require fresh legislative notice but the reader would form an imperfect idea of the state of morals at rome were he left in ignorance of the fact that the number of male prostitutes was probably full as large as that of females that as in greece the degrading phenomenon involved very little disgrace that all the roman authors allude to it as a matter of course that the leading men of the empire were known to be addicted to such habits that the aedile abstained from interference save where a roman youth suffered violence and that to judge from the language of the writers of the first second and third centuries of the christian era the romans like some asiatic races appeared to give the preference to unnatural lusts houses of prostitution having examined the laws which governed prostitution at rome and the classes into which prostitutes were divided it is now requisite to glance at the establishments in which prostitution was carried on m dufour and others have followed publius victor and sextus rufus in supposing that during the augustine age there were forty-six first-class houses of ill fame at rome and a much larger number of establishments where prostitution was carried on without the supervision of the aedile as it is now generally admitted that the works bearing the name of publius victor and sextus rufus are forgeries of comparatively recent date the statement loses all claim to credit and we are left without statistical information as to the number of houses of prostitution at rome registered prostitutes were to be found in the establishments called lupanaria these differed from the greek dicteria in being of various classes from the well-provided house of the peace ward to the filthy dens of the esquiline and suburban wards and farther in the wide range of prices exacted by the keepers of the various houses it is inferred from the results of the excavations at pompeii and some meagre hints thrown out by latin authors that the lupanaria at rome were small in size the most prosperous were built like good roman houses with a square courtyard sometimes with a fountain playing in the middle upon this yard opened the cells of the prostitutes in smaller establishments the cells opened upon a hall or porch which seemingly was used as a reception room the cells were dark closets illuminated at night by a small bronze lamp sometimes they contained a bed but as often a few cushions or a mere mat with a dirty counterpane constituted their whole furniture over the door of each cell hung a tablet with the name of the prostitute who occupied it and the price she set on her favors on the other side with the word occupata when a prostitute received a visitor in her cell she turned the tablet round to warn intruders that she was engaged over the door of the house a suggestive image was either painted or represented in stone or marble one of these signs may be seen to this day in pompeii within similar indecent sculptures abounded bronze ornaments of this style hung round the necks of the courtesans the lamps were in the same shape and so were a variety of other utensils the walls were covered with appropriate frescoes in the best ordered establishments it is understood that scenes from the mythology were the usual subjects of these artistic decorations but we have evidence enough at pompeii to show that gross indecency not poetical effect was the main object sought by painters in these works regular houses of prostitution lupanaria were of two kinds establishments owned and managed by a bod who supplied the cells with slaves or hired prostitutes and establishments where the bod merely let his cells to prostitutes for a given sum in the former case the bod was the principal in the latter the women there is reason to suppose that the former were the more respectable petronius alludes to a house where so much was paid for the use of a cell and the sum was an ass less than two cents messalina evidently betook herself to one of these establishments 
which, for clearness' sake, we may call assignation houses, and, as it appears she was paid in copper, aira poposkit, it is safe to infer that the house was of slender respectability. The best houses were abundantly supplied with servants and luxuries. A swarm of pimps and runners sought custom for them in every part of the city. Women, ankillai ornatrijes, were in readiness to repair with skill the ravages which amorous conflicts caused in the toilets of the prostitutes. Boys, bacariones, attended at the door of the cell with water for ablution. Servants who bore the inconsistent title of aquarii were ready to supply wine and other refreshments to customers, and not a few of the lupanaria kept a cashier called willicus, whose business it was to discuss bargains with visitors and to receive the money before turning the tablet. Under many public and some of the best private houses at Rome were arches, the tops of which were only a few feet above the level of the street. These arches, dark and deserted, became a refuge for prostitutes. Their name, Forniges, at last became synonymous with Lupanar, and we have borrowed from it our generic word fornication. There is reason to believe that there were several score of arches of this character, and used for this purpose, under the great circus and other theatres at Rome besides those under dwelling houses and stores. The want of fresh air were severely felt in these vile abodes. Frequent allusions to the stench exhaled from the mouth of a fornix are made in the Roman authors. Establishments of a lower character still were the pergulae, in which the girls occupied a balcony above the street. The stabula, where no cells were used, and promiscuous intercourse took place openly, the turturilla, or pigeon-houses, the casauria, or suburb-houses of the very lowest stamp. The clearest picture of a Roman house of ill-fame is that given in the famous passage of Juvenal, which may be allowed to remain in the original. The female, it need hardly be added, was Messalina. Dormire virum cum senserat uxor, Ausa palatino tegetem prae ferre cubili, summere nocturnas meretrix augusta cuculos, linquebat comitan quila non amplius una, sed nigrum flavo crinem abscondente galero, intravit calidum veteri centone lupanar, et celam vacuat que sua, Tu ne nuda capillis constitit auratis titulum mentita luciscae, ostendit quetum generose britannice ventrem. Excepit bland intrantes, at quaira poposcit, et resupina iacens multorum absorbuit ictus. Mox le nonne suas iam dimitente puellas tristris abit, et quod potuit, tam ultima celam clausit ad huc ardens rigidae tentigine vulvae, et lassata viris nec dum satiata recessit, obscurisque genis turpis fumoque lucernae foida lupanaris tulit ad pulvinar adorem. The passages in italics contain useful information. We shall allude to some of them hereafter. Meanwhile, it is evident from the line Mox Lenone, etc., that, at a certain hour of the night, the keepers of houses of ill fame were in the habit of closing their establishments and sending their girls home. The law required them to close at daybreak, but probably a much earlier hour may have suited their interest. Allusion has already been made to the fornices under the circus. It is well understood that prostitutes were great frequenters of the spectacles, and that, in the arched fornices underneath the seats and the stage, they were always ready to satisfy the passions which the comedies and pantomimes only too frequently aroused. This was one formidable rival to the regular lupinaria. The baths were another. In the early Roman baths, darkness, or at best a faint twilight reigned, and besides, not only were the sexes separated, but old and young men were not allowed to bathe together. 
but after Scylla's wars, though there were separate Sudaria and Tepidaria for the sexes, they could meet freely in the quarters and chambers, and any immorality short of actual prostitution could take place. Men and women, girls and boys, mixed together in a state of perfect nudity, and in such close proximity that contact would hardly be avoided. Such an assemblage would obviously be a place of resort for dealers and prostitutes in search of merchandise. At a later period, cells were attached to the bathhouses, and young men and women kept on the premises, partly as bath attendants and partly as prostitutes. After the bath, the bathers, male and female, were rubbed down, kneaded, and anointed by these attendants. It would appear that women submitted to have this indecent service performed for them by men, and that health was not always the object sought, even by the Roman matrons. Several emperors endeavored to remedy these frightful immoralities. Hadrian forbade the intermixture of men and women in the public baths. Similar enactments were made by Marcus Aurelius and Alexander Severus, but Heliogabalus is said to have delighted in uniting the sexes, even in the washroom. As early as the Augustan era, however, the baths were regarded as little better than houses of prostitution under a respectable name. Taverns or houses of entertainment were also in some measure brothels. The law regarded all servants waiting upon travelers at inns or taverns as prostitutes. It would appear also that butchers, bakers, and barbers' shops were open to a suspicion of being used for purposes of prostitution. The plebeian aediles constantly made it their business to visit these in search of unregistered prostitutes, though, as might be expected from the number of delinquents and the very incomplete municipal police system of Rome, with very little success. The baker's establishments, which generally included a flour mill, were haunted by a low class of prostitutes to whom allusion has already been made. In the cellar where the mill stood, cells were often constructed, and the aediles knew well that all who entered there did not go to buy bread. Finally, prostitution, to a very large extent, was carried on in the open air. The shades of certain statues and temples, such as those of Marcius, Pan, Priapus, Venus, etc., were common resorts for prostitutes. It is said that Julia, the daughter of the Emperor Augustus, prostituted herself under the shade of a statue of Marcius. Similar haunts of abandoned women were the arches of aqueducts, the porticos of temples, the cavities in walls, etc. Even the streets in the poorer wards of the city appear to have been infested by the very lowest class of prostitutes, whose natural favors had long ceased to be merchantable. It must be borne in mind that the streets of Rome were not lighted, and that profound darkness reigned when the moon was clouded over. End of section 5《Section 6 of the History of Prostitution》。《Section 6 of the History of Prostitution》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The History of Prostitution》by William Sanger《Section 6 Chapter 4 Rome》Part 2 Habits and Manners of Prostitutes A grand distinction between Roman and Greek prostitution lies in the manner in which commerce with prostitutes was viewed in the two communities. At Athens, there was nothing disgraceful in frequenting the dicterion or keeping in hetaira. At Rome, on the contrary, a married man who visited a house of ill fame was an adulter, and liable to the penalties of adultery. An habitual frequenter of such places was a moikos, or scortator, both of which were terms of scathing reproach. When Cicero wishes to overwhelm Catiline, he says his followers are scortatores. Until the lowest age of Roman degradation, moreover, no man of any character entered a house of ill fame without hiding his face with the skirt of his dress. Even Caligula and Heliogabalus concealed their faces when they visited the women of the town. The law prescribed with care the dress of Roman prostitutes, 
on the principle that they were to be distinguished in all things from honest women. Thus, they were not allowed to wear the chaste stola, which concealed the form, or the huita, or fillet, with which Roman ladies bound their hair, or to wear shoes, socus, or jewels, or purple robes. These were the insignia of virtue. Prostitutes wore the toga, like men. Their hair, dyed yellow or red, or filled with golden spangles, was dressed in some Asiatic fashion. They wore sandals, with gilt thongs, tying over the instep, and their dress was directed to be of flowered material. In practice, however, these rules were not strictly observed. Courtesans wore jewels and purple robes, and not a few boldly concealed their profligacy under the stola. Others, seeking rather to avoid than to court misapprehension as to their calling, wore the green toga proudly, and over it the sort of jacket called amiculum, which, like the white sheet of baronial times, was the badge of adultery. Others, again, preferred the silk and gauze dresses of the East, sericae vestis, which, according to the expression of a classical writer, seemed invented to exhibit more conspicuously what they were intended to hide. Robes of tire were likewise in use, whose texture may be inferred from the name of textile vapor, ventus textilis, which they received. The law strictly prohibited the use of vehicles of any kind to courtesans. This also was frequently infringed. Under several emperors, prostitutes were seen in open litters, in the most public parts of Rome, and others in litters which closed with curtains, and served the purpose of a bedchamber. A law of Domitian imposed heavy penalties on a courtesan who was seen in a litter. In the Lupaner, of course, rules regarding costume were unheeded. Prostitutes retained their hair black, but, as to the rest of their person, they were governed by their own taste. Nudity appears to have been quite common, if not the rule. Petronius describes his hero walking in the street and seeing from thence naked prostitutes at the doors of the Lupanaria. Some cover their busts with golden stuffs, others veal their faces. It has already been mentioned that the rate of remuneration exacted by the prostitutes was fixed by themselves, though apparently announced to the edile. It is impossible to form any idea of the average amount of this charge. The lowest classes, as has been mentioned, sold their miserable favors for about two-tenths of a cent. Another large class were satisfied with two cents. The only direct light that is thrown on this branch of the subject flows from an obscure passage in the strange romance entitled Apollonius of Tyre, which is supposed to have been written by a Christian named Symposius. In that work, the capture of a virgin named Tarsia by a bod is described. The bod orders a sign or advertisement to be hung out, inscribed, He who deflowers Tarsia shall pay half a pound. Afterward she shall be at the public service for a gold piece. The half pound has been assumed by commentators to mean half a Roman pound of silver, and to have been worth thirty dollars. The gold piece, according to the best computation, was about equivalent to four dollars. But whether these figures can be regarded as an average admits of doubt, even supposing our estimate of the value of the sums mentioned in the ancient work to be accurate. The allusion to Tarsia suggests some notice of the practice of the Roman bods when they had secured a virgin. It will be found faithfully described in that old English play, Pericles, Prince of Tyre, which is sometimes bound up with Shakespeare's works. When a bod had purchased a virgin as a slave, or when, as sometimes happened under the late emperors, a virgin was handed to him to be prostituted as a punishment for crime, the door of his house was adorned with twigs of laurel. A lamp of unusual size was hung out at night, and a tablet exhibited somewhat similar to the one quoted above, stating that a virgin had been received, and enumerating her charms with cruel grossness. When a purchaser had been found and a bargain struck, the unfortunate girl, often a mere child, was surrendered to his brutality, and the wretch issued from the cell afterward, 
to be himself crowned with laurel by the slaves of the establishment. Thus far of common prostitutes. Though the Romans had no loose women who could compare in point of standing, influence, or intellect with the Greek hetaire, their highest class of prostitutes, the famosai or delicatae, were very far above the unfortunate creatures just described. They were not inscribed in the Idal's rolls. They haunted no lupaner or tavern or baker's stall. They were not seen lurking about shady spots at night. They wore no distinguishing costume. It was in broad daylight, at the theatre, in the streets, in the Via Sacra, which was the favourite resort of fashionable Rome, that they were to be found, and there they were only to be distinguished from virtuous matrons by the superior elegance of their dress, and the swarm of admirers by whom they were surrounded. Indeed, under the later emperors, the distinction, outward or inward, between these prostitutes and the Roman matrons appears to have been very slight indeed. They were surrounded or followed by slaves of either sex, a favorite waiting-maid being the most usual attendant. Their meaning glances are frequently the subject of caustic allusions in the Roman poets. Many of them were foreigners, and expressed themselves by signs from ignorance of the Latin tongue. These women were usually the mistresses of rich men, though not necessarily faithful to their lovers. We possess no such biographies of them as we have of the Greek hetaire, nor is there any reason to suppose that their lives ever formed the theme of serious works, though the Roman erotic library was rich. What little we know of them we glean mostly from the verses of Horace, Tibullus, Ovid, Propertius, Catullus, Martial, and from such works as the Satyricon of Petronius and the novel of Apuleius, and that little is hardly worth the knowing. The first five poets mentioned, Catullus, Horace, Propertius, Ovid, and Tibullus, devoted no small portion of their time and talent to the celebration of their mistresses. But beyond their names, Lydia, Chloe, Lalogy, Lesbia, Cynthia, Delia, Niera, Corinna, etc., we are taught nothing about them but what might have been taken for granted, that they were occasionally beautiful, lascivious, extravagant, often faithless and heartless. From passages in Ovid, and also in one or two of the others, it may be inferred that it was not uncommon for these great prostitutes to have a nominal husband who undertook the duty of negotiating their immoral bargains, leno maritus. The only really useful information we derive from these erotic effusions relates to the poets themselves. All the five we have mentioned moved in the best society at Rome. Some of them, like Horace, saw their fame culminate during their lifetime. Others filled important stations under government. Ovid was intimate with the Emperor Augustus, and his exile is supposed to have been caused by some improper discoveries he made with regard to the emperor's relations with his daughter. Yet it is quite evident that all these persons habitually lived with prostitutes, felt no shame on that account, and recorded unblushingly the charms and exploits of their mistresses in verses intended to be read indiscriminately by the Roman youths. Between Ovid and Martial, the distance is immense. Half a century divided them in point of time, whole ages in tone. During the Augustan era, the language of poets, though much freer than would be tolerated today, was not invariably coarse. No gross expressions are used by the poets of that day in addressing their mistresses, and even common prostitutes are addressed with epithets which a modern lover might apply to his betrothed. But Marshall knows no decency. It may safely be said that his epigrams ought never again to be translated into a modern tongue expressions designating the most loathsome depravities, and which, happily, have no equivalent, and need none in our language, abound in his pages. Pictures of the most revolting pruriency succeed each other rapidly. In a word, such language is used and such scenes depicted as would involve the expulsion of their utterer from any house of ill fame in modern times. Yet, Marshall enjoyed high favor under government. 
he was enabled to procure the naturalization of many of his spanish friends he possessed a country and a town-house both probably gifts from the emperor his works even in his lifetime were carefully sought after not only in rome but in gaul spain and the other provinces upon the character and life of courtesans in his day he throws but little light the women whose hideous depravity he celebrates must have been well known at rome their names must have been familiar to the ears of roman society but this feature of roman civilization the notoriety of prostitutes and of their vile arts properly belongs to another division of the subject roman society it was often said by the ancients that the more prostitutes there were the safer would be virtuous women well done said the moralist to a youth entering a house of ill fame so shalt thou spare matrons and maidens as this idea rests upon a slender substratum of plausibility it may be as well to expose its fallacy which can be done very completely by a glance at roman society under the emperors even allowing for poetical exaggeration it may safely be said that there is no modern society perhaps there has never existed any since the fall of rome to which juvenal's famous satire on women can be applied independently of the unnatural lusts which were so unblushingly avowed the picture drawn by the roman surpasses modern credibility that it was faithful to nature in fact there is unhappily too much reason to believe the causes must be sought in various directions two marked distinctions between modern and ancient society may at once be noticed in no modern civilized society is it allowable to present immodest images to the eye or to utter immodest words in the ears of females or youth at rome the contrary was the rule the walls of respectable houses were covered with paintings of which one hardly dares in our times to mention the subjects lascivious frescoes and lewd sculptures such as would be seized in any modern country by the police fill the halls of the most virtuous roman citizens and nobles ingenuity had been taxed to the utmost to reproduce certain indecent objects under new forms nor was common indecency adequate to supply the depraved taste of the romans such groups as satires and nymphs leda and the swan pasiphae and the bull satires and she-goats were abundant some of them have been found and exhibit a wonderful artistic skill all of these were daily exposed to the eyes of children and young girls who as propertia says were not allowed to remain novices in any infamy again though a horace would use polite expressions in addressing tenderness or lalogy the latin tongue was much freer than any modern one there is not a latin author of the best age in whose writings the coarsest words cannot be found the comedies were frightfully obscene both in ideas and expressions a youth or a maiden could not begin to acquire instruction without meeting words of the grossest meaning the convenient adage carta non le rubescit was invented to hide the pruriency of authors and one of the worst puts in the wretched plea that though his page is lewd his life is pure it is quite certain that whatever might have been the effect on the poet his readers could not but be demoralized by the lewdness of his verses add to these causes of immorality the baths and a fair case in support of juvenal will be already made out a young roman girl with warm southern blood in her veins who could gaze on the unveiled pictures of the loves of venus read the shameful epigrams of martial or the burning love-songs of catullus go to the baths and see the nudity of scores of men and women be touched herself by a hundred lewd hands as well as those of the bathers who rubbed her dry and netted her limbs a young girl who could withstand such experiences and remain virtuous would need indeed to be a miracle of principle and strength of mind but even then religion and law remained to assail her she could not walk through the streets of rome without seeing temples raised to the honor of venus 
that Venus who was the mother of Rome, as the patroness of illicit pleasures. In every field and in many a square, statues of Priapus, whose enormous indecency was his chief characteristic, presented themselves to view, often surrounded by pious matrons in quest of favor from the god. Once a year, at the Lupercalia, she saw young men running naked through the streets, armed with thongs with which they struck every woman they saw, and she noticed that matrons courted this flagellation as a means of becoming prolific. What she may have known of the Dionysia or Saturnalia, the wild games in honor of Bacchus, and of those other dissolute festivals known as the Eves of Venus, which were kept in April, it is not easy to say, but there is no reason to believe that these lewd scenes were intended only for the vicious, or that they were kept a secret. When her marriage approached, the remains of her modesty were effectually destroyed. Before marriage, she was led to the statue of Mutinus, a nude sitting figure, and made to sit on his knee, ut eius pudicitiam prius deus delibasse videtur. This usage was so deeply rooted among the Romans, that when Augustus destroyed the temple of Mutinus in the Velian War, in consequence of the immoralities to which it gave rise, a dozen others soon rose to take its place. On the marriage night, statuettes of the deities Subicus and Prema hung over the nuptial bed, ut subacta a sponso viro non se comoeat cum premitur. And in the morning, the jealous husband exacted, by measuring the neck of his bride, proof to his superstitious mind that she had yielded him her virginity. In the older age of the Republic, it was not considered decent for women to recline on couches at table as men did. This, however, soon became quite common. Men and women lay together on the same couch, so close that hardly room for eating was left. And this was the custom not only with women of loose morals, but with the most respectable matrons. At the Feast of Trimalchio, which is the best recital of a Roman dinner we have, the wife of the host and the wife of Habinus both appeared before the guests. Habinus amused them by seizing his host's wife by the feet and throwing her forward, so that her dress flew up and exposed her knees, and Trimalchio himself did not blush to show his preference for a gitten in the presence of the company, and to throw a cup at his wife's head when her jealousy led her to remonstrate. The voyage of the hero of the Satyricon furnishes other pictures of the intensely depraved feeling which pervaded Roman society. The author does not seem to admit the possibility of virtue's existence. All his men and women are equally vicious and shameless. The open spectacle of the most hideous debauchery only provokes a laugh. If a man declines to accede to the propositions which the women are the first to make, it must be because he is a disciple of the Aversa Venus, and whole cities are depicted as joining in the hue and cry after the lost frater of a noted debauchee. The commissationes which Cicero enumerates among the symptoms of corruption in his time had become of universal usage. It was for them that the cooks of Rome exhausted their art in devising the dishes which have puzzled modern gastronomists, for them that the rare old wines of Italy were stowed away in cellars, for them that Egyptian and Ionian dancing girls stripped themselves or donned the nebula linea. No English words can picture the monstrosities which are calmly narrated in the pages of Petronius and Marshall, well might juvenile cry, vice has culminated. It is perhaps difficult to conceive how it could have been otherwise, considering the example set by the emperors. It requires no small research to discover a single character in the long list that was not stained by the grossest habits. Julius Caesar, the bald adulterer, was commonly said to be husband of all men's wives. Augustus, whose youth had been so dissolute as to suggest a most contemptuous epigram, employed men in his old age to procure matrons and maidens, whom these purveyors of imperial lust examined as though they had been horses at a public sale. The amours of Tiberius in his retreat at Capre cannot be described. 
it will suffice to say there was no invention of infamy which he did not patronize, that no young person of any charms was safe from his lust. More than one senator felt that safety required he should remove his handsome wife or pretty daughter from Rome, for Tiberius was ever ready to avenge obstacles with death. The sad fate of the beautiful Melonia, who stabbed herself during a lawsuit which the emperor had instituted against her, because she refused to comply with his beastly demands, gives a picture of the age. Caligula, who made some changes in the tax levied on prostitutes and established a brothel in the palace, commenced life by debauching his sisters, and ended it by giving grand dinners, during which he would remove from the room any lady he pleased, and after spending a few minutes with her in private, return and give an account of the interview for the amusement of the company. Messalina so far eclipsed Claudius in depravity that the profuse debauches of the former appear, by contrast, almost moderate and virtuous. Nero surpassed his predecessors in cynic recklessness. He was an habitual frequenter of houses of prostitution. He dined in public at the great circus among a crowd of prostitutes. He founded, on the shore of the Gulf of Naples, houses of prostitution, and filled them with females whose dissolute habits were their recommendation to his notice. The brief sketch of his journeys, given by Tacitus, and the allusions to his minister of pleasures, Tigellinus, leave no room for doubting that he was a monster of depravity. Passing over a coarse galba, a profligate Otho, a beastly Vitellius, a mean Vespasian, and a dissolute Titus, the mission revived the age of Nero. He seduced his brother's daughter, and carried her away from her husband, bathed habitually in company with a band of prostitutes, and set an example of hideous vice while enacting severe laws against debauchery. After another interval, Commodus converted the palace into a house of prostitution. He kept in his pay three hundred girls of great beauty, and as many youths, and revived his dull senses by the sight of pleasures he could no longer share. Like Nero, he violated his sisters. Like him, he assumed the dress and functions of a female, and gratified the court with the spectacle of his marriage to one of his freedmen. Finally, Elagabalus, whom the historian could only compare to a wild beast, surpassed even the most audacious infamies of his predecessors. It was his pride to have been able to teach even the most expert courtesans of Rome something more than they knew. His pleasure to wallow among them naked, and to pull down into the sink of bestiality in which he lived the first officers of the empire. When such was the example set by men in high places, there is no need of inquiring further into the condition of the public morals. A censor like Tacitus might indignantly reprove, but a marshal, and he was, no doubt, a better exponent of public and social life than the stern historian, would only laugh and copy the model before him. It may safely be asserted that there does not exist in any modern language a piece of writing which indicates so hopelessly depraved a state of morals as Marshall's epigram on his wife. Secret Diseases at Rome At what period and where venereal diseases first made their appearance is a matter of doubt. It was long the opinion of the faculty that they were of modern origin, and that Europe had derived them from America, where the sailors of Columbus had first contracted them. This opinion does not appear to rest on any solid basis, and is now generally rejected. The fact is that the venereal disease prevailed extensively in Europe in the 15th century, but the presumption, from an imposing mass of circumstantial evidence, is that it has afflicted humanity from the beginning of history. Still, it is strange that Greek and Latin authors do not mention it. There is a passage in Juvenal in which allusion is made to a disgusting disease, which appears to bear resemblance to venereal disease. Epigrams of Marshall hint at something of the same kind. Celsus describes several diseases of the generative organs, but none of these authors ascribe the diseases they mention to venereal intercourse. Celsus prefaces what he says on the subject of this class of maladies with an apology. 
nothing but a sense of duty has led him to allude to matters so delicate but he feels that he ought not to allow his country to lose the benefit of his experience and he conceives it to be desirable to disseminate among the people some medical principles with regard to a class of diseases which are never revealed to any one after this apology he proceeds to speak of a disease which he calls inflammatio colis which seems to have borne a striking analogy to the modern phimosis it has been supposed that the elepantiasis which he describes at length was also of a syphilitic character and the symptoms detailed by aretos who wrote in the latter half of the first century certainly remind the reader of secondary syphilis but the best opinion of to-day appears to be that the diseases are distinct and unconnected women afflicted with secret diseases were called alcunuentai which explains itself they pray to juno fluonia for relief and use the aster atticus by way of medicine the greek term for this herb being bonborion which the romans converted into bubonium that word came to be applied to the disease for which it was given whether in the case of females or males modern science has obtained thence the term bubo the romans said of a female who communicated a disease to a man haec te in bubinat we find moreover in the later writers allusions to the morbus campanus the clatsomenae the rubigo etc which were all secret diseases of a type if not syphilitic strongly resembling it it must be admitted however that no passage in the ancient writers directly ascribes these diseases to commerce with prostitutes roman doctors declined to treat secret diseases they were called by the generic term morbus indecens and it was considered unbecoming to confess to them or to treat them rich men owned a slave doctor who was in the confidence of the family and to whom such delicate secrets would naturally be confided but the mass of the people were restrained by shame from communicating their misfortunes as was the case among the jews the unhappy patient was driven to seclusion as the only remedy however cruel and senseless this practice may have been as regarded the sufferer it was of service to the people as it prevented in some degree the spread of contagion up to the period of the civil wars and perhaps as late as the christian era the only physicians at rome were drug sellers enchanters and midwives the standing of the former may be inferred from a passage in horace where he classes them with the lowest outcasts of roman society the enchanters sagai made filters to produce or impede the sensual appetite they were execrated and even so amorous a poet as ovid felt bound to warn young girls against the evil effects of the aphrodisiacs they concocted midwives also made filters and are often confounded with the sagai the healing science of the three classes must have been small about the reign of augustus greek physicians began to settle at rome they possessed much theory and some practical experience as the treatise of celsus shows and soon became an important class in roman society it was not however till the reign of nero that an office of public physician was created under that emperor a greek named andromachus was appointed archiater or court physician and archiatii populares were soon afterward appointed for the people they were allowed to receive money from the rich but they were bound in consideration of various privileges bestowed on their office to treat the poor gratuitously they were stationed in every city in the empire rome had fourteen besides those attached to the vestals the gymnasia and the court other large cities had ten and so on down to the small towns which had one or two from the duties and privileges of the archiati it would appear they were subject to the idals it may seem almost superfluous to add that no careful medical reader of the history of rome under the empire can doubt but the archiati filled no sinecure and that a large proportion of the diseases they treated were directly traceable to prostitution end of section six